there. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Despite best plans, I bollocked up the start again. Sorry about that. Uh, welcome, everyone, um, to FCA's first uh, in a series of um, webinars, The Road to Net Zero and Agriculture's Contribution. We have folks from all over the world joining us today. My name is Corey Watts. I'm um, a policy advisor to FCA and General Rouseabout. Um, and uh, very shortly, I'll hand over to our CEO. Um, I just want to run through a little bit of housekeeping before I mess it up and to help you. Uh, the first thing is, um, please use the Slido link to ask questions. Um, that's the way uh, we can manage it best. So try to avoid putting your questions into um, Zoom, the Zoom comments. Uh, please turn off your microphone unless you're speaking and none of you will speak, I think. Um, you'll just use your keyboards. Um, and if you don't, we'll turn it off for you. Uh, so without further ado, allow me to introduce um, Farmers for Climate Action CEO, Wendy Cohen, who will uh, give us an acknowledgement of country and also introduce the session. Wendy. Thank you very much, Corey. I uh, trust you can all hear me. <clears throat> um, uh, welcome to the very first session of our new Road to Net Zero webinar series, as Corey alluded to. Um, we're really excited to bring you um, this next uh, um, evolution, I think, in, in, in the delivery of some fabulous uh, digital resources to our farmers and, um, and rural and regional Australia in general. Uh, before we kick off, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I live in Canberra, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their leaders past, present and future. I'd also like to acknowledge the First Nations owners of the lands you are joining us from. It's a very soggy, wet, cold day in Canberra here. I hope that uh, wherever you are, you're enjoying um, nice weather, be it wet, to alleviate the droughts or uh, um, just something that's good for the ducks in the garden. Um, before we move on to wonderful presentations from two exceptional leaders in agricultural practice, research and science, Lucinda Corrigan and Tom Davison, I'd like to thank the incredible team of Farmers for Climate Action for their work in bringing all of our recent webinars to life. They're such an inspiring group of people to work with. And I know many of you um, really enjoy interacting and chatting uh, with, with the team at FCA. So thank you to them. As you know, the National Farmers Federation uh, has now committed to a policy of net zero by 2050. Uh, what that means is really exciting for us, uh, but we know that we have to be more ambitious continually to, 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 to move beyond that, that ambition. Um, and in setting uh, this goal for our farmers, um, uh, they have told us that they want to know more about the practical ways they can reduce emissions in their own businesses, on their own farms, and also how they can add their voice and experience to influencing our policymakers. To date, our programs, webinars and other resources have, uh, that have been delivered digitally in these challenging times have been focused more on the vision, the big ideas, the high level policy asks. But now is the time to delve more into the detail of how you as farmers, how farming communities and the industry as a whole can make practical use of the information and strategies in your day-to-day -day work to lower emissions on farms and contribute to carbon neutrality across rural and regional Australia. This first webinar puts livestock emissions front and centre and it's such a topical and important area. At FCA, we're committed to connecting with as many farmers as we can and support the growth of climate literacy across the country. As we build our networks, uh, we can deliver more climate smart ag knowledge and we can build our voice. We know that we'll have a much greater influence on our leaders to make the right decisions about climate policy as we do this. So thank you all so much for attending this webinar. It's great to see so many people engaged. I can't wait to hear from Lucinda and Tom today. We're really privileged to be able to call them part of the FCA family. And I know you'll all take a great deal from their presentations today. So back to you, Corey. Thank you, Wendy. Wonderful. Okay, so we're doing it a little differently today than we've done in the past. We're going to have back-to-back -back presentations and then, and this is at Tom and Lucinda's request, 
that they will then form a panel or two that uh, and it's at that point that we'll ask questions that you send us. Uh, so do hold your questions until then. Um, now at the end of it, uh, if there's still a uh, uh, a gaggle of questions that need asking. Uh, Tom and Lucinda have very kindly agreed to um, uh, to spend a little more time after the session has ended to answer some of those. So if you have to, do stick around. Or if you want to, do stick around. Um, so as Wendy said, this is part of a, a series. So we will be holding um, ones on soil carbon, agroforestry, and a whole lot of other things too. Uh, and we do like to do things, we like to focus take everything from the back paddock to the big picture, uh, action on the farm and beyond the farm gate. And so to that end, I'll introduce Tom Davison. Tom is a researcher at the University of New England, specializing in uh, livestock and climate change and emissions management. He's previously worked at uh, Meat and Livestock Australia, where he was one of the architects of uh, the CN30 uh, program, the MLA's commitment there to, to net, uh, net zero by 2030. Um, and so over to you, Tom, he will give us the industry view. Thanks, Corinne. So uh, today, I just want to take you through um, a story around the opportunities and the role of agriculture in proceeding towards a carbon neutral agriculture in Australia. And I guess the context, the high level context now has been set by the NFF, their 2030 roadmap, which was mentioned before. And in pillar two, it sets out there that Australian agriculture is trending towards carbon neutrality by 2030. It's not actually giving a commitment, is it? But it's saying trending towards. So um, I, I guess I want to talk um, a little bit about that and some of the context around why and how this COD could possibly happen once I work out how to move my screen forward. So first I want to talk today about productivity drivers and then a little bit about climate influences, consumer influences, the potential role of carbon with CN30 in the red meat industry as an example and then what I think needs to happen uh, for that to be achieved. Um, so the first thing is that agriculture is basically driven profit-wise from productivity and in grazing systems is what drives profit. So really most of agriculture for the last 100 years or more has been driving down the cost curve. That's how you stay competitive. Um, the factors affecting productivity include things like genetics, new technologies, labour education, uh, systems approaches and attrition. Attrition means people leaving the industry. And within that R&D options and innovations are absolutely key. But agriculture, of course, um, sits in a social policy, trade and environmental context. And accessing new incomes beyond product level is quite novel for agriculture. So the creation of the carbon market circa 2012 is, is really um, a landmark move and strategy, which um, agriculture is, is starting to take advantage of. And there's a whole bunch more opportunities in there. So for example, um, red meat properties were the first to really latch on to the opportunities within the Emissions Reduction Fund. And uh, now about 60 to 70% of all the contracts under the Emission uh, Reductions Fund um, sit, with the, um, sit with the red meat industry. And these are in projects that are sitting under re vegetation regen, plantation, savannah fire management, beef herd management, and soil carbon. So still there's amazing opportunities. and the big cattle corporates that I deal with are now talking about using the phrase, how do we monetize sustainability? So um, that's fascinating. That, that's a big shift. And then you, you start to move away from just running down the cost curve to stay competitive. You actually now can engage in a new, completely new income source. So um, within that, Productivity equation, I'll give a short advertisement for the program I work in, which is called the Livestock Productivity Partnership. So this is the partnership between New South Wales DPI, UNAE, CSIRO, the MLA donor company, University of Melbourne and the University of Taz. And we're doing things like looking at brassicas in different sites of Australia as a, as a new option compared with forage oats, as an example. So some exciting work there. We're looking at tropicals for Southern Australia and so, have a look at that photo and you see the snow in the background. 
um, where we're testing some tropicals, um, yet the graphs on the right are showing that as we warm up our climate, the, the drift and move of tropicals into Southern Australia will become more prospective. Um, so these are two maps that show the change in temperature over time and the, the likely uh, habitats for tropical grasses. And then, you know, a whole bunch of new next gen supplements for Northern Australia and what can we do there in terms of lifting um, the pregnancy rates of animals and cows in the north. So productivity um, is a big play. Yeah, the big strategic driver, of course, around the cover market has been the, the climate, the future climate, um, which changes which probably everyone on this um, webinar is very aware of. And um, one of the big issues in there that we're trying to deal with for our grazing system, of course, is a massive increase in extreme heat loads and extreme heat events. So we've done some recent analysis on that um, changing picture of, of heat um, stress on our systems. And, and this graphic here is probably, is, is probably our best evidence to date of the, of the impact of changing climate on heat stress. And um, the evidence for global warming is substantiated by this graphic. So then, um, but we're dealing with big changes in rainfall, for example, in Southern Australia, um, and uh, the drying of the environment. The, the climate scientists would say that we haven't moved out of the millennial drought, and uh, there's potentially a permanent change in lower rainfall in Southern Australia, as you can see there. So this is data from over the last 20 years. And so to that end, within the LPP, well, how does future climate impact on grazing systems and the profit they're from. So we're looking at seven case studies right up, east, up and down Eastern Australia. And we're just not looking at uh, traditional, what can we do to, to stay profitable, but how do we access the carbon markets of the future, the biodiversity markets of the future, and um, not to mention new practices in forages and animal genetics. So let's shift from there to sort of the social and consumer influences. So the perfect storm for the red meat industry as described by the International Meat Secretariat is the emission, is the impact of GHG emissions from the red meat industry. We get beaten up by that pretty regularly. The impact on biodiversity from tree clearing, and groups like McDonald's are engaging in that and have made commitments not to source meat where from properties where tree clearing occurs. Um, the impact on animal welfare, you, hear about that regularly in the news about the animal rights activism, the live export pressures. The ALP has committed to not having sheep exports within a time frame, and New Zealanders haven't been doing it for some time. Uh, red meat in the human diet is copying um, regular criticism from WHO, the United Nations and group like, groups like the Eat Lancet group. And then within our own domain, we see the impact of climate change on grazing systems and what we need to do about that to stay profitable. So some very big strategic plays in there. And so what does, it, what does an industry like the red meat industry do about that? Um, and this is just some of the misinf not mis misinformation coming out from the United Nations and other groups which the industry has to push back about it, back about. So in 2017, after some analysis I initiated within MLA, um, a managing director put this challenge to the industry, which they've taken up, which is to develop an aspirational target for the Australian red meat industry to achieve net zero emissions by 2030. So this was an incredibly uh, bold and brave target to set, given this was announced in very late 17. Um, but I have to, I have to um, take full responsibility for asking him to go for that year target and by doing that, by setting an early target of 2030, you actually have to create the energy and the commitment uh, to, to make something happen. Whereas if you push it out to 2050, for example, well, everyone just says, yeah, well, that's, that's down the track. We don't need to worry. But when you set a very short timeline target like that, it really concentrates the mind. But we did say that there are a few caveats around that. Um, and one of the caveats was the need to do a whole bunch of R&D uh, around some products and processes and practices which had not yet um, shot, had not yet been taken into commercial practice, and we'll talk about those in a minute. 
So it's really important to remember, this is really important for the Cinder's talk and, and how you think about this net zero approaches. This is at the inventory level. It's not at the farm level. So for an industry to achieve this, you don't need every farm to be carbon neutral. Uh, we know that's not gonna happen. So, but the inventory measures things at the helicopter or satellite level. So it's the change in trees on a landscape, the number of animals by class of animals over time and their emissions, um, et cetera, which is what the inventory adds up to, to come up with a number. And then we had to go in to that inventory, inventory in quite detail because there's no, no little button you can press to say, what are the emissions from the red meat industry in Australia? You have to go in and do quite a bit of detail analysis about where are the trees being cleared, where are the savannah, fire, uh, where are the savannah fires happening, et cetera. And you have to do that um, in the areas in the property where the red meat is produced to look at the emissions from the processing sector and the feedlotting, feedlot sector, et cetera. So there was a lot of work went into just getting a baseline for, for the industry. So that's what we did in 2017. And then late 17, um, MLA put this to the industry as a target to go for. And it's had an enormous effect on the industry and MLA and how it does its work. And also a lot of industries and a lot of organizations now quote it as an example of what's possible. But you got to remember this, there were caveats put around making this happen. We'll talk about some of those. So why would an industry do this? Well, first of all, they had to stay ahead of the consumer and community and customer expectations. Um, but if you, if we did do it, you would remember those six factors in the per perfect storm I talked about. If you actually achieve that, you take away a lot of criticism from your industry and your product, for example, um, you take out the criticism around GHG emissions, you take out the criticisms around biodiversity and uh, loss, et cetera, by, by doing this. Maintain market access, more particularly, more importantly, in the high value first world markets. Um, you enable ongoing access to capital, you minimise the need for regulation. Webinars, yeah. So, so the baseline was back, the baseline that we're working on is net zero emissions against, um, uh, by 2030 against the 200, 2005 baseline. So why 2005? Well, that was pretty much the government commitments under the Paris uh, Climate Accord agreements is the baseline. And then we've been, or the industry, MLA more particularly, have been measuring the changes in the total industry emissions um, every, every year since then. And you can see there was that initial drop down, whereas we were 21% of the national, total national emissions, a bit over 700 million in 05. We're now about 12, we were 12% 12 in 15 and around 10% now in 17 from the red meat industry. So there are those little orange bars at the top of the big blue bars. And that's graphically uh, represented on the right there. Most of the emissions come from cattle, uh, the next from sheep and virtually none from goats. So the trend's been good, but most of those, most of that decrease has occurred through reduction in tree clearing, through legislation in, in Queensland. So you can't, we, we know that the big emissions are methane from grazing animals, but you have to look at the whole carbon cycle. This is a fantastic diagram which Rich Eckard put together for the cycling of carbon in grazing systems. And uh, the, the methane, the CHP story is by far the big one, but there's a whole bunch of other carbon processes which we need to be aware of and, and more importantly, take advantage of through methods and practices. So I talked about productivity right at the start, you might remember. So those processes in there um, are at the heart of productivity changes on a farm and it's how we manipulate those processes and the flow of carbon um, can have a big effect on our productivity, but it's also each of those arrows uh, represent places where we could potentially make money through carbon markets. So that's the big change. So incentivizing sustainability, incentivizing changes in practice could lead to um, a way of funding productivity changes, which we've never seen the opportunities of before. So when you go into even more detail in the red meat sector, so this is the analysis we did back in 17 of what was coming from transport, processing, manure, uh, deforestation, afforestation within the red meat sector. That's that diagram uh, bar graph on the left. And you can see that um, uh, the, blue, the blue bar there is the enteric emissions. Um, the green bar down the bottom is the, is the tree planning going on and the 
yellow orange bar, yellow bar is the deforestation processes. So you can see transport's very small, processing manure, uh, feedlot stuff is very, very small. Then you go to the right hand bar graph and you can see that most of the emissions are really coming from beef cattle at pasture and the next from sheep at pasture with a very small proportion coming from beef cattle and feedlots. So if you really want to go to CN30, you've got to knock out, um, you've got to knock out the methane uh, from cattle at, at past, in pasture systems with sheep being um, a secondary target. So if you want to attack methane, you've got to understand methane. So we went into the methane pathway within the rumen in great detail and looking at all the different processes in that steps of producing it and then what are the options to manipulate it or knock it out. So I was around reducing it, knocking out methanogens, blocking pathways, etc. So that's the sort of deep analysis which our research groups have gone into over the last 10 or 15 years to do that. And then we looked at a bunch of options around which ones might be the most prospective. So these are options for mitigation. And you've got to remember, we're not going to be able to sell this any new practices unless we get a productivity gain. We're just not going to do it off the back of reduced um, carbon or methane emissions. We're going to have to actually deliver a productivity gain because that's how people make their money. And so we recently wrote a paper that we, we can, um, which will come out next month, which basically looks at a revised estimate of the productivity gains and the methane mitigation from some uh, potential practices of which asparagopsis, many of you have heard about, that's the red algae, the three knot product coming out of DSM in Switzerland. And we've identified a couple of forages, legume, deep rooted legumes like Lucina and Desmanthus, which are showing great promise to both increase productivity around that um, 15, 20, 25% and, and reduce methane at the same time. So no, let's not dwell on this one, but this is MLA's uh, plan on a page about how they might do that through methane. And they've just recently come out with an expression of interest to call for projects in this whole area. And the reason I mentioned the LPP group is because the partners in the Livestock Productivity Partnership have, have um, said, we, we want to work together on this in this, in this plan on a page. And, um, and why? Because a lot of the people in the LPP have that background and experience to do that. So to, to get to CN30, you got to actually come up with some pathways. Well, it's, it's just not a, a dream, but how would this actually happen? So some very, very big um, aspirational targets um, are going to be required. And you really have to work for any industry to do this. You've got to work backwards from what needs to be done, not, not what's possible now, but what needs to be done. And that changes your whole mindset about the type of R&D that you have to do. So we said, right, oh, well, that's the 2005 baseline. This is where we were in 2015. It has, it's changed a little bit to 17, but not much. What if we did nothing, business as usual? Um, what if we um, stopped all the tree clearing um, as per the legislation that has been coming at us? Um, well, you'd, you'd knock down your emissions um, uh, roughly, uh, not quite by half. So business as usual, 2015 current, we were sitting at about 70 million tonnes. Those other graphs we're showing, we're, we're now down around 60. So yeah, you can, you can knock out your carbon dioxide equivalents by reducing the tree clearing. Um, you can make your animals in feedlots a lot more efficient, but it won't make much difference. You've really got to do some major changes in your grazing systems by putting in legumes and, and, uh, and, some, of the, and some of the supplements that are coming on board. But to really get there uh, strongly, you've got, to, you've got to plant a bunch of trees. You've got to knock out the methane in the grazing systems and have a multi-pronged approach around genetics, soil carbon, savanna, manage, savanna fire management, and, um, and vegetation regen management. So it's really a multi-pronged approach, but the beauty of the red meat industry is that you've got a whole bunch of options. We have a whole bunch of options here due to the land scale, due to all these practices that we can employ. And uh, there's a few things that need to be done to make this happen. So these are just my personal views. Um, there's still some major investment required in R&D to reduce methane in grazing systems. How do we get those red algae and as asparagopsis and three knops into grazing systems? No work's been done on that yet. Lots of talk, lots of yep. Everyone thinks it's 
around the corner and it's not. Um, no significant money has been spent at all on how to put those into grazing systems and that needs to happen. Um, how do we sequester carbon in, in trees and soil and fit that into grazing systems? We haven't done a lot of work in that in Australia at all. Lots of work in Brazil, very little in Australia. Um, in, and how do you pull those different elements together around supplements and sequestration and integrating integrated grazing systems work yet to be done. The government um, is very supportive around new methods under the ERF and needs to, needs to continue to be so as we come up with new algorithms around how we reduce emissions from methane and sequester carbon. We need a carbon market to continue to incentivize practice change. It needs to stay in place. Um, preferably we need an increase in carbon pricing over time and all the strategic directions of carbon would say that that is going to happen. You only have to see the EU price of carbon now is around $40 a tonne, it's over $30 a tonne in Canada, etc. So that's, that's highly prospective. We need much simpler approaches to aggregated carbon projects in farming communities. So a large number of smaller farmers can engage in it. At the moment, it's, it's, um, it's not a large number of farmers, even though um, a high proportion of the RF contracts other in the industry, it's not a large number of farms per se. And collaboration with the private sector is going to be absolutely essential to get some of these new products into the marketplace and into grazing systems. So, um, Corey, that's my personal view. And um, I guess um, the hope is that if that's achieved, then the um, remit industry will look a bit more like this in 2030, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you um, thank you very much. <laughs> Good That's on it, you, mate. mate. It's wonderful. Thank you very, very much. That was a really good um, high-level overview of the challenges and the opportunities uh, in the sector. And I just want to say, uh, you know, there's a clearly there's a, a long there's a lot of work to be done, a long road yet. But uh, a couple of things I picked up on. Um, one is I think I think it's the first livestock industry group anywhere in the world that has committed to uh, a um, neutrality target. That's not to be sneezed at, so that's that's really good. And the other one is, um, I, I really like what you said before about, you know, we looked at what needs to be done and set our sights on that. I, I think that's a great thing. So I'll stop yapping. Um, we have some questions coming in, but I will go hand over to Lucinda Corrigan, who is FCA's chair amongst many other things. Apparently she also farms, but, um, uh, I've known Lucinda for a long, long time and she still puts up with me. So she, uh, Lucinda is going to give us the farm level view about what is being done now. Lucinda, over to you. Thanks, Corey. Just want to get this um, presentation up. So why won't it show on my no. files? Is that us? No. Is there anything we can do to help? Um, well, Claire and I just went through it. Hang on. Uh, it's on my desktop. Where's my desktop? Just give me a minute. Um, Morris. <coughs> Where are we? Here we are. And can you see Yay. the... Got it? Yep. That's you good. Uh, um, yep. That we just need to make it one big picture. You need to make it one big picture. Um, okay. So just do that. Help, help me there. <laughs> um, hang on. Where do I go? Down the bottom? No? Yeah. Yay. All good. Okay. Beautiful. Great. Um, and what I'd really like to do, just one more, is just so I can see you and me. Good. Okay. Lovely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for asking me to um, give our case study today. And I, I want to sort of stress at the beginning that, you know, this is not a strictly commercial beef operation. It is a genetics operation. So it is different to commercial beef production. And you'll pick some of that up. And, and one of the big differences is in the amount of data that we have that we collect and have access to. So it is very intensive. I often say that what we do is more like a dairy farm, except the product is in milk. <laughs> it's genes. Um, thanks, Tom, for the update. And that's really um, good because it sort of gets your head into that, well, what's coming next and what do we need to do. So just a quickly, a little bit of background. Um, Brian's family settled at Rennie Lee in 1872. So we now have uh, three generations working together. Um, radio. Now, how do I go to the next slide? Is it that one? No, it's not that one. Page down. Somebody help me. 
Tom, what did I do? What do you do for page down? Uh, just the arrow, just press the arrow. The arrow's not doing it. Not working. There we are, beautiful. Yay. Okay, <laughs> lovely, okay. So um, this is our current family group, plus we have um, another um, four or five employees that work with us. Uh, my background's from a wool growing uh, background in the Western Riverina. And uh, I often say my family were conservationists before the word was invented. So I planted trees. My dad was a keen tree planter. We put solar hot water on the roof in 1964. Trout fisherman, ornithologist, artist. So we really, we've always sort of loved, I guess, the natural world that we live in and which we farm in. So when I came to Rennie Lee in the mid eighties, uh, we started planting trees straight away and we've been doing that every year. And this year we planted another, um, we planted another 3,600 on about 10 hectares. And so we've just continued that practice of, um, yeah, of, 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 of revegetating our landscape. Okay, now that doesn't happen easily. So what's the trick to that? Going to the next slide, sorry. That's all right, just, um, just it's not return, return. it's not return, it's not arrow, it's not arrow. Uh, return, no. So, wait, look. Clicking the mouse, how about clicking the mouse? Okay, beautiful. So here, here are the guys this year, just finished the fencing on the tree lines and the new tree line, um, which uh, we've, we've finished. So, um, my children are very much grown up with this as a business as usual core activity. We run about uh, three and a half thousand head of cattle on 3,600 hectares plus some adjustment country. And I think we're really lucky that we have a team that's half um, men and half women because it really um, brings in a diversity of opinion. Our daughter Ruth runs the cow herd and the bulls are run by a fairly uh, new employee, Claire Scott, who's Irish. Um, our country comprises of, so this is our home block where uh, I live and walk and work every day. And we bought this, this particular property we bought back in 2010. It had gone out of the family. And we've now planted about 10% of uh, that place in, under trees and um, revegetated it, including all the sort of water flow lines. And it's been a, a fantastic, I guess, case study of what you can do. The, the hill in the background was a degraded sheep camp and it was, it was almost no cover on it at all. And it's been locked up from livestock since 2011. And there's just amazing regeneration of um, the, the indigenous species, as well as the trees we planted. So we run a, um, okay, and that's the, the country that we have at Colcan. So we have about five farms over there, um, quite small. You know, this is sort of coming out of the, I guess the post second world war soldier settlement scheme. So. There were traditionally quite small farms in the Colcan area of around about a thousand to, to sort of 1600 acres. And um, the soil is very rich and alluvial. So it's quite different to the shallow granite based soils that we have at Rennie Lee. Um, we have a system where we're running our cows at Bona where we live on the places here. We run dry stock on a couple of the places and then we run the bulls because they're our main sort of sale product they run on a couple of places and we really like to keep them off, uh, tr try and limit where we put them because they do a fair bit of damage to the country and they require a lot of management. So it's a genetics business. Um, here's some cows at home. We call the system we're developing sustainable intensification and we take advice from one of the key proponents of, of that idea, which is Professor Tim Reeves. And I quite often chat with Tim about, you know, what we're thinking and how we're trying to get the system to work. We don't sell cattle in bad years. So we've had to develop quite a lot of sort of intensive, um, um, intensive ways of managing cattle and taking them off the country, including containment areas, sacrifice paddocks. Uh, we've put in a couple of pivots this year to um, bring the, the weaner females uh, through the dry autumns. So this is the bull that just topped our re recent bull sale. And I just want to make the point that he's not just a bull, he's actually a heap of data because everything is measured. His phenotype, his genotype, his, um, all the attributes from the day of birth when we collect a DNA sample and then that's sent, it, the DNA is extracted and sent to America and then we get back 50,000 data points 
by the time he's four months old. So we're in a position where we really can, um, if we have the investment, we can really, um, I guess, ask the questions about what are the traits we need to get predictions on to improve our selection for coping with, um, especially with climate change, but, but um, the needs of the consumer and the value chain and, um, and the health traits, and I guess um, some of the things about animal welfare. I also sit on the board of uh, Data Gene, which is the dairy genetic improvement company for Australia. And uh, Data Gene's come up with this idea of the resilient cow. And what does the resilient cow of the future look like that's gonna cope with, um, with what, what the climate's throwing at us, plus, I guess, um, community concerns and social license issues around animal welfare. And uh, it's a really nice uh, mind model, I guess, for thinking about um, the traits we might need to gather data on. So the environment we have is actually a really rich environment for ag tech. So here's his data from our bull sale catalogue the other day. And I'm not, the reason I'm just putting this up is to show you that, um, you know, we've got all these traits around carving ease, uh, maternal traits in his growth, um, his milk, the milk of his daughters, his fertility, his carcass weight, um, his carcass performance, and um, he's a very high marbling bull, and also his docility. Plus, at the end there are the indices. So indices mean that you put all these traits together, the traits of interest, and you can see that his indices were all in, oh, many of them were in the top 1% for the breed. So that just gives you an idea of the power of the system and, and obviously behind that sits algorithms. And um, that's also got, so it's had, he, it's his measurements have been taken on him, measurements have been taken on his relations, and then his genomics has also been measured. So here's our resilient cow. She's got a Fitbit on and we're collecting data constantly. And this is probably not that far away. Um, I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of disruption across our industry. Nearly all the bull sales this year have been conducted on uh, digital platforms such as Auctions Plus. Um, we've got this great opportunity to improve the way we meet consumer um, expectations by bringing data from um, the consumer back into our breeding goals. And genomics is the ultimate big data. So if you think about all those 50,000 data points, um, I'd love to see us sort of branch out into a couple of new traits the one we're really interested in is um, feed efficiency on grass, because when you think about the rumen, the rumen is a big vat filled with microbes, um, like Tom's described, which can handle low quality um, cellulose and pastures. And so um, having that ability to, um, um, you know, get more measurements using sensors to improve our um, selection safer pasture intake and, and uh, assess the quality and quantity of pasture will be, will be a big step forward. Um, I, just in the last 12 months, I thought I'd just mention some of the, um, the innovations that we've adopted in our business. So our, we've adopted um, farm bot uh, water monitoring systems, so we can do that remotely. And we've got the same for our two new um, centre pivots, so all that can be monitored remotely. We, um, We've replaced our herd management software after 25 years, and that's always very, very painful. And this one's been particularly painful, but we've changed to a system that is much more cloud-based and has, is much better at transferring data as soon as we get it. So we're moving away from a paper-based system, which some of my employees are very sad about. We have a database manager who's been with us for 20 years and uh, she loves she loves to have paper back up and everything. because she's, she's very, very good at what she does. But um, yeah, it's, I think the time to ditch the paper is, is upon us. So we've been in this uh, pilot with um, um, MLA, looking at uh, the, the, the beef industry. And um, so this is our emissions profile now. We've actually done this before. This is using the tool out of the University of Melbourne's Climate Change Centre run by Richard Eckhart. And we did this back in 2011 because Ruth completed a postgraduate diploma in climate change for agriculture when she worked for the Victorian Department of Primary Industries. So, um, so this is sort of the total emissions profile. And I guess it's no surprise, 80% of our um, emissions are um, methane, but we've also got um, a substantial um, portion there in terms of purchased feed 
and um, and smaller portions in sort of manure and fertilizers and um, our other energy requirements. We've we've got lots of things we, we've started to do. One is to put solar across the various farms, and we've we've done a couple of systems and 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 batteries in time, um, and all those things I guess require require investment. Um, so the key. So when I look at the um, when I look at the actual uh, printout and just just focus on the two figures down the bottom corner. And that is the emissions intensity, um, carb, um, CO2 equivalents per kilogram of live weight um, before we did any, before we included any of the activities that we'd done around um, tree planting. And so that 8.3 kilograms per kilogram of live weight was one of the lowest that um, the consultant Steve Wiedemann had seen in a grazing system and uh, that, that gives me great heart, but with a genetic improvement program and a lot of efficiency around target markets for all the different animal classes. So we, everything has a target and we don't leave it to chance. So we make sure we have the feed on hand. And I'm not really talking about grain. I'm talking about hay, silage, straw, uh, the new set of pivots and, um, even the weaners, we wean a thousand calves in January and we put them into a containment area. And I meant to put a photo of it, but I didn't in the presentation. We put them in the containment area and they are fed a, a diet which is virtually without grain. There's, we started off feeding them. I think the uh, nutritionist designed a ration with about 15% grain and it was too much. They were growing too quickly and it had adverse effects such as on foot structure. So we're... Um, so we've cut that right back to well under um, 10%. I think it's about 7% of the ration now. And that's plenty. So um, we, I guess what I'm really saying is we can do most of this without grain. And with the females, because we'd like to access grass-fed supply chains, and uh, there's a lot of demand um, from some of the branded products, such as Great Southern, um, we, we were really keen to do, do it on grass if we could, and we, the, the new centre pivot system now allows us to grow sort of high quality, um, well, dare I say high quality, um, high production um, sorghum, Sudan grass, uh, those sorts of things over the summer, because that's when our big feed gap is going into the autumn. Um, so for us, the key, to lowering emissions from a genetics point of view is really about um, manipulating the growth curve. And uh, I can't overestimate the importance of this. So calves are born, they're light at birth, they grow quickly. We've um, spent, a, we, we, in our breeding goal, we concentrate on them growing very quickly to 400 days, but not continuing to grow so that our cows end up like elephants. We don't want bigger and bigger cows. We actually think we lack the tools, when we talk about this resilient cow of the future, we lack the tools to really cap maturity pattern. And that's one of the things I am passionately interested in is trying to, to, get, a better, um, to get better phenotypes, which are the measurements on the animals, to get the you know, better algorithms in our DNA and our genomics to help us um, get that maturity pattern right in the cow herd. Um, and then we've also selected for meat quality. So we, we're trying to um, get the best cow for the environment and the best cow for the consumer and, 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 and combine that. And there are always trade-offs in, in breeding. So I think we understand the genetic relationships very well and um, we manipulate those. So the second figure there that I really wanted to highlight was when we included our trees, that emissions intensity dropped to 3.3. Now, we won't die in a ditch about the 3.3 because um, there were lots of questions about uh, the stage of maturity of some of our tree plantings, um, whether they were still, um, you know, putting down, uh, putting down the carbon in the, in the wood that um, the modelling would suggest. And um, when I we took out an emissions reduction fund contract a few years ago, Ruth and I did the 100 pages of... <laughs> Um, we did about the 100 pages that had to be done to get a contract. And um, then we found we just couldn't um, meet the audit requirements. It was much more expensive to get them audited than to drop the contract. So we dropped the contract. 
But I guess um, it's all about what the modelling of the sort of um, land care plantings that we've done, whether that meets um, the estimations that are in the national accounts, because it's all about the rules, isn't it? So I, I just make that point. But it still was very encouraging to see such a uh, profound fall in emissions intensity based on the trees we have planted over 30 years. And it allows us to think about things and, and work out um, you know, how much further we might go with tree planting. And, and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's really an important piece for us. I make the point that 70% of the dry matter in a, in a self-replacing cow calf system like ours is consumed by the cows. So it's not actually by the product, it's by, we always call the cows, you know, the factory. They're the, they're, that's, they're the girls that actually um, generate the, I guess, the, the product that we sell out of the business. And then of course, when they reach the end of their reproductive life, they, they also go off into hamburgers. We've been lucky. We've worked with researchers uh, for over 30 years. Um, I run a little R&D company within the business. And so we, we're lucky we could collaborate with um, University of Adelaide, um, Angus Society of Australia. We've co collaborated with three beef CRCs. See, we've just done a couple of contracts with CSIRO. And we also, we have a local beef group. We, um, we ask questions like when fertiliser prices rose a lot during the GFC, we set up an alternate fertiliser trial under a dem producer demonstration site funded by MLA. The funding allowed us to employ a scientist and he collected the data and we ran that for five years. And that, that was really interesting in terms of saying, well, will these products replace you know, the fertiliser regimes we're using? You know, how do we do nitrogen in the system? Obviously, legumes are such an important piece and I, I'm really glad that you know, Tom obviously highlighted that and for us, that's a that's really important because we'd love to get rid of, um, I guess, um, nitrogen additives such as um, urea and so on and really um, use uh, the full range of legumes to um, provide our nitrogen in the grazing system. Um, we're all passionately interested in, um, in our, our environmental footprint. And I just um, wanted to, to highlight, I think in a family agribusiness like ours, you know, we really have about a 30 year time frame. You know, we, we're looking at, we're transitioning now to the next generation, generation uh, five and generation six is, you know, coming on the ground. It's very different to public companies. There's, a, there's a, an investment company, Westchester, who's selling a whole lot of land near us at Colcan. And they've only been there five minutes, I think 2014. Um, so it's very short term and they have a very different view, I think, about sustainability and stewardship. It's all about, you know, short-term um, investor returns. We, we really want to be able to farm here in this rapidly changing environment. We've certainly seen profound changes in our available water, in um, our biosecurity risks. I was really glad to see the former um, chief veterinary officers come out last week and talk about biosecurity risks changing. I mean, pathogens and... Um, Disease, pathogens, diseases, uh, weeds are moving south, they're moving east, and we're certainly experiencing that in our farming environment. We, um, we love to, I guess, chew the fat with some of our networks, and uh, we, we have a very you know, progressive group of, I guess, clients and friends and colleagues, and, 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 and very much uh, talk to the science community regularly to, to, to think about uh, the challenges in our farming system. And I think the other thing I'm very, we're very lucky about is that we have a sort of a fairly strong Gen Y component of the business. About half of the team are under 35. And uh, so um, if we, we have any doubt about what they think, they'll tell us. And they all just consider that climate change and, you know, dealing with it at a business level is, is a given. Um, Oh, I haven't mentioned lots of other pieces we do, like we have a very experienced consulting agronomist who assists us with, we soil sample all the blocks each year. We pick, um, you know, we do them on a cycle, but a really important thing with soil sampling, and I'm always a little bit amused when I hear discussions about soils sort of in the national agenda is, you can't just take a soil test and that's it. What you need to do is establish the trend lines. And that's really about three or four years testing across paddocks to work out what's happening and to perhaps remove some of the um, laboratory inconsistencies and make sure that the sampling is correct. I'd also say that um, 
when we have sensors that can do soil tests without having to send it off to a lab, that will be a really fantastic step forward because that will help us. Um, so what comes next after this CN2030 pilot is um, we've been asked to give all our, all our data for, the, for two financial years. So that's 17, 18 and 18, 19. No, it's 18, 19, 19, 20. So we're now providing all that data back to uh, the Ag Integrity team that are running the CN2030 project. And so what they're trying to do is, is work out, I think what Tom said before, this idea of industry inventory. So we become a bit of a pilot for the more intensive pasture-based businesses, I guess, in Southern Australia and, and, seeing, and seeing whether we can um, you know, use um, the experiences, I guess, that they get from, from doing that intensive work in our business across um, other, other um, producers that do what we do. Um, okay. And I guess the other thing I haven't really talked about is our approach to pastures, which is very much about perenniality. So we are very keen to uh, establish perennial pastures across all the different um, bits and pieces of the landscape. We have um, areas of lucerne, which is about 400 hectares. We've got a lot of um, phalaris and uh, legume-based pastures. Then we've got the areas of native perennials, which, of which there's about six to 800 hectares and um, some short-term uh, rotation pastures. We, we have, we've bought a couple of blocks where there's been problem, you know, quite deep problems with soil structure because of continuous cropping, and they require some different approaches. And uh, I think um, Tom mentioned uh, brassicas. We've, we've experimented this year with tillage radish and um, turnips and uh, some really um, you know, heavy-rooted uh, short-term crops to help us improve the soil structure. So next uh, steps is, I guess, um, hopefully we will get some new tools. So I think the genetics approach has brought us this far. And now we'll, um, we'll look forward to some of the new products such as feed additives, vaccines, new pasture legumes. And I've become really lately really interested in biochar. I think that probably has a potential for us if we can find... Um, you know, the feedstock to turn into biochar. And there's Ruth and I sitting on a rock. Thank you very much. Thanks, Corey. Thank you, Lucinda. My gosh, there's <clears throat> so much in all of that. And, um, uh, and I should have said before, we had uh, a couple of hundred people RSVP to this particular uh, session, um, not just in Australia either, all around the world. And so welcome to you all. Uh, and that just shows the level of interest um, from a lot of different quarters. We have policy people, consultants, farmers, land carers, researchers, companies, finance, everyone. Um, now, we are running short of official time. So what I will do is um, I will do my little wrap up bit now. And then anyone who wants to stick around, uh, Tom and Lucinda, are you okay to stick around for say 15 minutes more? Because we have a lot of questions. And okay, so sure. they're all really good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lucinda. Um, and so folks, I mean, if you need to go, please, obviously by all means, but we'd love to have you stick around. And there, these, there are some really cracking questions. So I'm just gonna do my bit. Uh, the two things I wanted to say, um, one is if you, if you go onto FCA's website, we have a Climate Smart Ag Toolkit, which is basically just um, a compendium of advice. Um, we don't tell people how to farm, we just put it forward there and resources, and we're continually building that and refining it. So please, any feedback, uh, anything you, you think we should look at, please do, do tell us. Um, we will, the next webinar will focus on soil carbon um, for all sorts of reasons, not least of which because it features, uh, it's a major part, or major focus or in the, the government's new low emissions uh, roadmap. Um, and the, there are pluses and minuses to that. And we, we want to have that discussion because we too are wrestling with that question. Um, the other thing I want to say is that uh, very, very soon, starting on the 16th of October, we have a series of online um, tutorials specifically for um, three fellowships that we're developing. So in Victoria, we've held, we've um, established 
a Climate Smart Agriculture Fellowship. It's been going a few years running now where we pick uh, 20 or so new and emerging leaders in agriculture and allied industries um, from across the state. We've now got a bit of funding to go to Queensland and also to focus on pastures and perenniality and grazing in Tasmania. So if you are a grazier or you are linked somehow to the grazing industry in Tasmania, or if you are in Victoria or Queensland and you are in agriculture generally, or you have some sort of strong connection, that could be a family connection, you could be an extension officer, land carer, uh, researcher, or what have you, and you want to know more about the big picture and back paddock issues around climate change and agriculture, please do get in touch. We have a few more places left for Victoria. We have a few for both Tassie and Queensland. Uh, you will get to hear from uh, some amazing people from high level scientists through to practitioners of all kinds. Uh, do let us know and you can find information on the website for that. All right. So my gosh, now the questions coming through. Okay, the first one I want to ask um, a quickie for you, Tom. Someone said, uh, how do we find out about your forthcoming paper? There's a lot of interest in that. Yeah, uh, so basically it was a re-look at um, an analysis we did in 2015-16, looking at all the prospect prospective candidates to reduce methane. And uh, we've updated that based on the research done in the five years since then and the economics around each of those major options. So that'll be coming out in Animal Frontiers in October. I'll make sure that I'll get a copy of the paper to FCO and you guys can- Nice one. As you wish. Nice one, good. So in Animal Frontiers, if you've got academic access through an institution, otherwise we will snaffle a one. It'll be an interesting, um, they've got a whole bunch of invited papers there looking at animal proteins globally wow. and the issues, so. Yeah, know, yeah, interesting, interesting. Interesting invited papers, yep. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, um, all right. So, uh, hi Tom, in reference to CN30, are there any options to apply for funding to work with land care groups to work on regional solutions? Well, um, the I guess the, there are a couple of options. One is through the red meat industry itself and the meat MLA donor company, which is always um, is open to propositions from parties which are prepared to put up funds of their own to potentially get matched by the Commonwealth. So, so that's one option. I don't know um, about too many others. The Cindy, you have some other avenues, but there aren't a lot of avenues. The Future Drought Fund, I don't think is going to focus on this area. No. And I haven't seen any initiatives around smart farms or rural R&D for profit. So, Lynn, do you have any other potential avenues? No, that's, that's one for FCA to campaign on, add to my list. <laughs> um, it, it, it does talk to the, it, but it does talk to the whole issue. I mean, the absolutely, yeah. Funding for this R and D um, was, was at a was at a, a really really high level in that period up to 2015 16, and then it pretty yeah. much off a cliff. Yeah, so that's a that's a major issue for all agricultural industries in this space. I, I quite agree. Um, it, there was the Carbon Farming Futures Program, which came up with some really excellent mm. research. By the way, you can find that on the Federal Department of Agriculture's website. Look up Carbon Farming Futures. It, there's some really terrific research in there. There was money for extension and then nothing. So that's... Corey, Corey I, think, I think the best um, reference for what was done in that period is probably changes in the air. So the report we did last year with the Australian Farm Institute really brought together all that research yeah, right. done. And I, I think for anybody who wants to get a quick and quick look at all that body of evidence would, would go to yeah, changes in the air, which is on our website. Yes, yes, uh, good. Thank you for that, Lucinda. Um, all right, okay, so to you, Lucinda, your emission spreadsheet says you've got 150 hectares of hardwood. Do you plant for carbon or for biodiversity or for fun? So we plant, um, we basically plant indigenous species for a host of sort of co-benefits. Um, co so we started off, I guess, doing the erosion control and, um, you know, managing our sort of riparian areas, but it's really branched into biodiversity, um, um, protection of, um, you know, some, some special sites. We've got some paddocks that are shut up permanently that are that have um, you know special attributes or regeneration um, 
And um, yeah, we, we basically are planting all local species. So it's, and they're nearly all hardwoods. So my question about, was very interesting when um, Ag Integrity gave us the aerial photo that the government uses to look at our trees. None of the trees we'd planted in the last 20 years showed up. <laughs> Only the old ones, the first sort of 10, 15 years, which was really crazy. So there's, there's quite a lot of improvement required in the tools that sit behind some of these. Um, but I, I guess, you know, we've got commitment now to do that. Mm. And, and that was a really good feedback from that, from that pilot. And how did you arrive at the 10% level, someone's asking? You said you put aside 10% of the land? Um, we've, we've actually planted 15% at Kalkan. And um, we've, I guess it's been really about um, managing... We, 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 as I say, we have a whole lot of co-benefits. So we bought a farm in 1994 that had about 29 trees on it. And so, you know, immediately we thought, oh, my God, we've just got to get some trees into this landscape. So we started off, you know, and it was about, um, it was about aesthetics and it was about um, tree bird habitat and it was about um, keeping Yoni's disease out from the neighbours. There were a whole lot of reasons, but there were co a lot of co-benefits. And so I yeah, guess right. we kept working on that. And we, we all sort of firmly think that it um, enhances the landscape and I guess we'll probably end up with at least 15% across all the properties. Mm, and it's often those co-benefits um, rather than any carbon benefit per se that, um, that sell people, isn't it? Um, okay, so we have quite a few questions for you, Lucinda, but I'm trying to alternate. Uh, Tom, what do you reckon? So there's quite a bit of talk now about something called GWP star. That's the um, recognition that methane from livestock uh, is short lived in the atmosphere and um, different people taking that in different ways. Uh, um, uh, yeah, do you have a view? Do you want to explain that better than I could? <laughs> um, yeah, GWP star is a way of looking at um, fluxes and flows of methane in the atmosphere. Um, when I was in MLA in 2012, if Beverly Henry's still online, she'll remember that we, Beverly led a project with Alan Lowe look at this issue. And so it's been taken up by some um, atmospheric physicists. And so it's sort of saying, well, there's a more accurate way of looking at methane because it only hangs around the atmosphere to 12 to 14 years. And so um, we're um, un unfairly, uh, let's say, the attribution to the red meat industry out of methane is, is, is deemed to be not reasonable because of its um, relative uh, short-lived nature in the atmosphere. Um, it's basically a calculation of what it was um, 20 years ago, multiplied by a factor of 112, take away, um, sorry, what it, sorry, what it is now going out versus what it was 20 years ago, multiplied by a factor of 85. So it's actually quite complicated. Yeah. You, you can't use it in a carbon market. And there's a really big problem if the red meat industry wants to push it that, um, it's great while your herd's going down, which is what we've been doing from, you know, going from 28 million down to 25 million. But if the herd goes back up, it's a real, it's a real negative for the industry. It'll actually look a lot, lot worse. So um, the, chance, the chances of it getting up as a new GWP factor in the inventory are low. The federal government said they're not chasing it or interested in it. Um, mm. And um, so I think, I think the chances of it changing um, are low because it can't you can't use it practically in a carbon market system. Mm. So if you want to make money from carbon markets, then hope that they just change, stay with a similar system, but they'll they'll definitely up the GWP factors. So we've gone from a global warming potential factor of 21 for methane. I think it's going up to 25 in June, and then it'll go above 30. So that's mm. the question. Mm. Mm. Some people are saying that. Um, because because methane is short lived, therefore livestock don't contribute to. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it was, well, well, it's all true and good, um, but methane goes out into the atmosphere, and um, you know it's got a global warming factor of around twenty five at the moment compared with carbon dioxide, and um, it, so it's just the like, total. The total levels are something like one hundred and fifty on one hundred and fifty percent of what they were a couple of hundred years ago, and. Mm. And, and livestock have definitely contributed to part of that, um, mm. not the whole of it by any means. Um, yeah. yeah, so it, as you say, it is complicated um, and not as straightforward, I think, as um, what well, was my view, as some people were saying. 
uh, one way or the other. Um, okay, so now seaweed additives, staying with you, Tom. Mm. What do you think about seaweed additives? And I, I want to follow you up on this, um, Lucinda. Uh, you know, Tom's point before about no one has worked out how to actually build these things. Once, once we've tested them and proven them, uh, the feed additives, how do you actually implement that in a farming system? So you first, Tom. Yeah, so um, Australia can lay claim to this one. It was actually in the National Livestock Methane Program 2012-15, where serendipitously, um, we, we actually discovered this red algae asparagopsis, knocked out methane in vitro. And that was because a brilliant scientist by the name of, um, um, excuse me, I'll remember his name in a sec. Anyway, JCU scientist who was working on algae um, came up with this as an option and we tested it in vitro. And um, then we went and tested in sheep and more latterly it's just been tested in feedlot cattle. So highly prospective in feedlot situations, it knocks out around 90% of the methane. Um, the, the issue is um, how do you actually get it consumed by cattle or sheep in grazing situations? And to date, as I said, no, no work um, has been done in the grazing situation on how we might do that practically. So that's ahead of us. But the opportunity there is enormous. Mm. And it certainly offers great hope that we could knock out a substantial, we won't, won't knock out 90% in grazing systems, but we would knock out a substantive part of it. Mm. And it's interesting, um, Jenny O'Sullivan, uh, who runs an operation down in, in Gippsland, a beef operation, she said to me once, once we started thinking of methane in terms that methane was lost energy, was lost energy from the animal and therefore lost productivity. Lost yeah, money. it's exactly that right. Mindset. Yeah, so it was a magnificent miss around methane because it was around only 10 to 12 percent of the energy of the animal going out. It didn't matter. But the why it matters is that if you can pull back some of that energy being lost, all the gains go to um, live weight gain. Mm. Above, it's above the maintenance line. And mm -hmm. mm. So the as the carbon price goes up, then the incentives. Mm who makes the money from reduced methane through these sort of practices ramp up enormously. Mm. And Lucinda, how would you, so there's, there's uh, the red seaweed, there's uh, the algae, um, there's also talk about vaccines and other things. How do you see that from a producer's point of view practically? Well, vaccines have been the great promise for a few decades. And I think um, if, if that one was nailed, that would be relatively easy. Um, you know, mm. a vaccine a year, it might be a follow-up vaccine like you do at the moment. But uh, I think the red algae one is probably much more for um, containment feeding. I, I, I don't at this stage, unless, you know, we, we develop some automated system. And I'm not saying that won't happen because I think there's so much happening now in the automation space mm. that it's... Um, that anything is possible. And I, I think of my cow with a Fitbit on and I think we'll get so much more data. Um, and the question would be, do we have the platforms to deal with it? So I think it'll be mm. like that. Mm, mm. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, all right. Um, and so does anyone, do either of you know, there's a question here about how many people, how many producers are using the carbon accounting process on the MLA website? Do, is there any sense of, of uptake? Um, well, I, speaking with Steve Wiedemann, um, he, he says there is massive interest. That's what he mm. said. And he says there wouldn't be a day go by that his phone doesn't ring from a number of producers wanting to work out how to do this. So um, I certainly think the genie's been let out of the bottle. I also think that at this stage, there's a fair bit of detail and, and we're trying to solve some of these issues like are our land care plantings actually going to meet the requirements and da 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 There's quite a lot of sort of technical sort of solutions that sit behind the, um, you know, the, the, the spreadsheets and the worksheets that we're using. So I think, I think in a way, you, you've, got to, you've got to go through hand-holding and we probably need a few more people like Steve who can actually do that. Yeah. I think that's what we really need. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, do you have a sense? No. No, I don't know. Um, but that, that uh, tool that Lucinda mentioned in her talk is, is the best and easiest to use by far. And you'll find that at the IPC. Triple C website, University of Melbourne's website, and um, yeah, yeah, you yeah. can jump in there, and you can have a very quick um, look see at your own operation and uh, yeah, what you might be able to do. 
Yeah, and so just for everyone, we can we can pop a link up there. I think there's actually a link to the uh, Primary Industries Climate Challenges Centre, which is what uh, Tom was referring to at the University of Melbourne. I think that link is on FCA's website, and we will uh, maybe um, we can put that to you. Um, there's some terrific work there, but you know I agree with you. I was just talking to um, someone last night about this that. There's still a lot of problems getting um, off the shelf accounting tools out to people in a way that people understand. There's some simple ones out there, but um, yeah. Uh, listen, did you use native grasses? Quite a few questions about that. Um, so we have we have areas of the farms that where we have native perennials. Yep. So they're mainly dominated by um, Bothria cloa and Microlina. So they're probably our two key native perennials. Uh, we don't sow native grasses um, at this stage, but we um, certainly preserve those areas. And mm, uh, they're mm. a key part of our grazing. We really like to put the girls up there before calving because it keeps them fit. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and maybe for both of you, but primarily to Tom, how important is it with, with the, the feed additives, um, and indeed, I suppose, with any future vaccination, how important is it to have them consuming them daily? Is there a lot of variation? How long does the effect last? Yeah, yeah, good point. Uh, well, with methane, it, it, for supplements like 3 knob or red algae, you, you would need that going in each day into the animal's rumen uh, to have its effect. Although um, what's, what's fascinating is that some work has been done recently um, by a number of parties looking at how do you create some multi-generational impacts an example of that is, can you feed the, the female mother of beef calves with an anti-methanogen? And will the impacts of that carry over to the offspring? And so a great study is being done as we speak by people like Chris McSweeney and Stu Denman Syro Brisbane on that very topic. And the indications are that you can get these multi-generational effects. So you're actually changing the, the makeup of the rumen biota through how you feed the mother. So we're, we're actively interested in that. That could potentially work for both 3 nop and mm. red, for example. Mm -hmm. so, you know, um, people talk about this all the time, but if people really want to know what's going on, you, um, you can engage with DSM. They're in, they're a big multinational based out of Switzerland. And if you want to know what's happening in um, the red algae space, then the company is called Future Feed. It was set up by CSIRO and they currently have a bunch of investors, um, you know, investing in that uh, developmental work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have some, some others coming in here. There's a lot of questions coming in about uh, the ERF or whatever it's called this week, um, the Climate Solutions Fund. Um, which is the government, if people don't know, which is the federal government's uh, program uh, that uses taxpayers' dollars <laughs> to pay for emissions reductions or avoided emissions, uh, originally in the land sector, and now it's been expanded, I think. Um, so in any future, and currently in any future um, scheme like that, that's an auction scheme, or if there was a, um, a market-based scheme, such as we had briefly, um, the practice changes that you've already made, Lucinda, or the other producers have already made, uh, some people are asking, you know, that, that, that constant, that perennial question, pardon the pun, about what you're awarded for versus, you know, where you set the baseline. If you've already done an awful lot of plantings, for instance, or you've already done a lot of work on soil, uh, are you, is that going to be rewarded uh, or... Um, you know, is that just wiped off because you've already done it? I think, well, from our, from our point of view, and it will depend a lot on, on where you're at, I think from our point of view, um, we'd probably no longer look at uh, securing contracts for, say, the trees we plant, or um, but because we think we'll use those to offset our own emissions. We think that's the key thing for us. But I think if we were to get some stewardship payments for improving biodiversity, and I look at some of these areas we've shut away, and um, you know, we, and obviously the big thing with biodiversity is what metrics you use. Mm -hmm. I'm currently sharing the sheet sustainability framework, um, one of the committees there, and um, it's very interesting because there are really no approved um, biodiversity, you know, metrics that 
that are meaningful. And so, and, and I'm talking about above, yeah. ground, above ground and below ground. So, um, but I, I think for us, that would be very attractive if we could, you know, be rewarded, mm. say, for, for improving small birds in the landscape and, and below ground, um, mm. low mm. ground biodiversity so, in the soil. Mm. Mm. Um, gosh, we've still got some more coming through. So I'm going to ask just a couple more. Um, one is uh, for both of you. Well, ask a question from myself in just a second. But one is about international collaboration, particularly with New Zealand, considering uh, livestock emissions is such a part, big part of their profile. Um, I know that some work has been done internationally. Where does Australia sit in that? Are we, are we actively cooperating with other countries, leading the way? Where are we? Well, um, probably people in LA and ADU might be a better place to comment on myself. Um, we certainly looked at it very actively during the phase of the NLMP. And um, I have to say, it was more, the, the relationship was more in the spirit of the Rugby World Cup, shall we say, <laughs> <laughs> than, um, wanting to walk, than wanting to walk up the marriage aisle. Mm. Right. Well... So, um, look, I think, I think they're, they, they've got a very active, vigorous and big investment in uh, methane research in particular in New Zealand. They're doing a great job. Um, that's the only place in the world that I'm aware of that they're having a crack at a vaccine. Um, don't, ho don't hold your, mm. you know, your candles in the window for that one because we haven't heard great noises on that front. Um, mm. But look, they're very professional, very smart scientists and doing great work. But you'd have to say there hasn't been a lot of collaboration. Um, and um, mm -hmm. that's because I, I, think, I think there's obviously some competitive elements in there. There's um, relationships with commercial parties, et cetera. So, um, and dollars. <laughs> yeah, dollars. And, but having said that, at the, at the individual scientist level, there's some great, great collaboration going on between individual scientists. So it, mm -hmm. I think it happens more at that level, Corey. Yeah, well, certainly uh, Rich Eckhart, who, who's at the University of Melbourne and advises us um, and will be one of the presenters um, in the fellowship programs. Um, I know he collaborates quite a bit internationally and there's been some good work done in California mm. on, on the seaweed too. Um, I have a question. It's really just a sort of a couple of follow-ups from what you were saying, Lucinda, but to you both. Um, uh, so, Lucinda, you know, you've got a very strong history and ongoing uh, commitment to working with the scientific community, umpteen different scientists that you are really quite a leader in that respect. Um, if you were giving, if you were talking to to other producers um, of, of varying sizes, how would you say they go about, or how important do you think those relationships are, and how would they go about forming those partnerships? Um, and if those partnerships, if partnership opportunities have aren't available. Is it worth producers sticking up their hand and saying, look, you know, this is the sort of thing we need? Corey, I think sort of accessibility to producers is probably best through the really good farming systems groups. So in Holbrook, we have the Holbrook Landcare Network. We've got yeah. um, 500 members, collaborations with lots of scientists. And I think to me, that's probably the best entry point. And mm. going and finding a group of like minds and asking the questions, like we did with the alternate fertilisers or mm. whatever the questions are in your farming system that you're trying to find a solution for, because some of these things, other people won't be able to give you the answer. You'll, you'll have to mm. actually, you know, dig it out yourself. So I, th mm. I, I think that's probably the best. And I also think that some of this leading edge stuff, the, the early adopters will solve it, you know, whether it's Jenny mm. O'Sullivan or it's, um, I see Jody Brown's online up there in Queensland mm -hmm. or, some of the early adopters will solve it and it's probably better for, for, especially for sort of the commercial industry, perhaps to wait till it's more accessible and the solutions are easier to, you know, as mm -hmm. Tom mentioned before, you know, whether it's spreadsheets you've got to fill out or trying to make this stuff so you can actually um, do it without taking masses of time. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you have a view? No, no comment. Mm. I know, I know. You know, reputation wise, I think those people who demonstrate a willingness to, it's been my experience at least, those people who demonstrate a willingness to learn, um, who rather than a defensive approach, say, well, okay, you know, what do we do? What do we need to do next? Um, and embrace those partnerships. Those are the people 
you know, they really stand out, I think, over, the over time. And Landcare has certainly um, helped um, those connections and a shout out to the Holbrook group. I know they're online. Um, I, okay. I think Holbrook could have a project where they actually demonstrate it at a point in time where the whole catchment is carbon neutral. I, I think mm. that is possible when we have the tools. So I'm, mm, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm pretty optimistic after this latest sort of pilot because I, mm. I suppose, you know, the work a lot of people are doing on genetics and so on has, is really starting to deliver some, mm. some low mm. fruit. Mm. And there are groups all right around the country the, uh, and various models. Uh, the Birch of Cropping Group, of course, is uh, very well known in Victoria. Uh, it's um, practically a farmer cooperative. Um, and again, you'll be hearing from those people in our fellowship program uh, and have been very proactive. And it's that proaction reaching out uh, that I think is a really good attitude to have. And there's a, there's a good um, regenerative agriculture group in WA in the Wheat Belt who have also um, uh, collaborating with researchers at UWA and elsewhere. Okay, so there are a few comments coming through. I think folks, we still have about 60 people online, but that uh, people have got, you've all got homes to go to and lunch to have and what have you. Um, but I want to ask just one more question with those folks online. Um, guys, how optimistic are you about the livestock industry's role and the role it can play in getting Australia to net zero by 2050, which isn't that far away? It's only a generation. <coughs> Yeah, so there's two questions in there. What's the what's the chances of the the red meat industry doing that? I think I think it's very high, but it, with those caveats of getting support around a whole bunch of R and D development work uh, and relationships with commercial companies to make that happen, I think there's a whole bunch of opportunities we haven't even started to to access and utilise yet. Um, the red meat industry was back in '05 around 120 million tonnes out of 700. And now it's about 60 to 70 out of 500 million tonnes. So taking 60, 70 million tonnes out of the national inventory is, is highly significant. Mm. And what's more important than what the red meat industry does, but um, how it motivates other industries to do similar things. Mm. And it might motivate other red meat industries in other countries to, to look mm. at it. Not every industry can go carbon neutral and shouldn't even try, but the main thing is to go in and investigate and look at the opportunities, because it's the co it's a it's the co it's the co influence between chasing um, reduced carbon emissions and raising productivity, which mm. is which is the beautiful synergistic point mm. um, we can look at. Mm. Thanks, Tom. Have you got a, a view, Lucinda? How optimistic are you? I'm very optimistic about getting to carbon neutrality, but I guess in terms of going further and, and, the, and the drawdown that will happen um, in, uh, that, that agriculture can help contribute to the rest of the economy where perhaps we don't have the opportunity. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done. I agree with Tom. We, we, you know, we, we, we need much more robust um, mm. systems and metrics and, uh, you know, I, an investment. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think the idea of, of, of stronger global partnerships, which has really come out of this meeting mm -hmm. today, is mm -hmm. one that we really need to um, put some time and effort into mm -hmm. as, as mm -hmm. an industry. Mm -hmm. Thank you to you both. It's been a, um, a real pleasure for me personally. And, you know, we've still got half our number online. So thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, we hope yeah. that that was useful to you. Uh, clearly we can't cover everything in the short space of time and if we've gone over time, but thank you. Do join us for the next <coughs> one on soil carbon. The date I think is yet to be announced and we're, we're teeing up the details on that one uh, soon. Uh, and if you haven't already put your name down on our website, please do consider it, it's free. Uh, you just get a few emails from us, but it's it's so good to have you all aboard. Uh, do support us. Um, and I think that will be it. We will continue our work and uh, we look forward to having you all join us again for the next one. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Lucinda. Bye-bye. Thanks, yep. Thanks, Bye. -bye. Thanks, Bye.